All right, it is five o'clock. We will call this meeting into order. Is there any public comment on the closed session agenda items? There is no public comment on closed session agenda items. All right, then it is five o'clock and we will uh, recess to closed session. We will reconvene an open session. Superintendent, if you would take the roll. President Holt. Present. Vice President Lynch. Present. Clerk Rickler. Present. Trustee Dow. Present. Trustee Ross. And if you would join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God. Indivisible with liberty and justice for all. And no action was taken in closed sessions. And I move to approve the agenda. I'll second that. Vice President Wedge seconded the motion. All in favor? Aye. 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 And those opposed? And the ayes have it. Okay. So. Moving to item seven, public hearings. Uh, we will open first the public hearing on the local control and accountability plan. There is no public comment. Uh, no one from the public here to speak on that. So we will gavel out and end that public hearing. And now to open the public hearing on the 22-23 Auburn Union School District proposed budget. And there is nobody here uh, to speak to that. So we will close that public hearing. Moving to item eight, public comment. We do not have any public comment at this time. Right. There is no public comment at this time. Moving forward to item 9A, the 2023 Local Control and Accountability Plan or the LCAN <laughs> presentation. Good evening, President Holt, trustees, staff. So the local control and accountability plan is a plan, is a part of a three-year plan. So this is year three coming up. 23-24 will be year three of the three-year plan. Um, and so in order to effectively write this plan, we look at the needs of our district. And some of the some of the things that we look at would be our California dashboard, our local indicators, and other measures of data as well to really identify what the needs are um, for our district. Um, so we looked at our data, we looked at major themes, and we took that data and our plan that we wrote that the last years of our plan and our themes our big picture ideas to uh, our public for community engagement to our parent advisory committee and to our student advisors um, to get their student voices um, and so with all of that input and data and our uh, so again year three of a three-year plan we made some revisions and some adjustments so when we originally um wrote the LCAP, we had specific goals. And so um, within those goals were actions. And the actions are really what we looked at um, reworking because our goals stay the same for the, for the duration of the plan typically. So we identified uh, the following needs, academics, behavior and engagement, and um, professional development. And um, so this is basically what you're looking at today is a slide deck that's already been mostly shared with the public it's actually online because we use this information to take to our parent advisory groups and we printed some of this to take to our student groups as well um, some of this was also presented at parent engagement at fa family engagement um, meetings as well and i say some because as we continued through the year to evolve with this plan some of the things changed so um, within the academics behavior and engagement and staff professional development um, 
areas we were looking at improving um, academics for our student groups and increasing scores for our underserved students. Um, we looked at VAPA and enrichment and um, art education for all students. We also looked to decrease suspension and expulsion rates as well, um, increase attendance for all students and um, community engagement by really finding ways to bring our families in to provide um, you know, that level of support that students need from their families, right? So we wanna make this a welcoming district where people come and feel um, like they're supporting their child. And then our professional development, we have um, conference style professional development. We have a coaching program. Um, and really, I'm gonna be honest, um, you know, when you look at our PD, I've been asked by other districts to share our PD catalog and some of the PD that we offer with other districts as well. Okay, so all students, including subgroups, will meet or exceed standards. So that's goal one in our LCAP. So what you're going to see in this slide deck is we're going to go goal by goal. Okay, thank you. So um, I'm going to give you the big bucket changes that we made. Some of the LCAP stayed the same. Some of, some of the bigger um, components changed a little, and some we changed a little bit more. So we reduced MTSS funding um, because we were able to provide training um, here in our district through our coaching program and uh, by working with our county partners. So Placer County Office of Education, as you well know, partners with us um, in a variety of ways. We had them here today to do some training for our staff. Um, Working with them under differentiated assistance has been really useful and helpful to our district because we happen to really need to work through MTSS, right? So we so we originally budgeted more money for the MTSS goal, thinking that we were going to have to go out and find um, agencies to come and provide consulting services, which is, can be very expensive. Our Placer County Office of Education, they're experts in this field. And so once we learned that we could utilize their support and services, we contracted with them. So some of the work they do, um, they do for us through differentiated assistance, and some they do um, through some of the, the LCAP funds. Um, Sarah Brickler, I have a quick question about the table that you're showing. Yeah. So when you see the contributing column and there's yes or no, so the yes indicates that we're using um, some of the funds um, identified through the LCAP process to fund that item. And then so can, can you just explain that why some of them say no? And Sure. Sure. Yes. Thank so you. the the contributing column, and and that that is a confusing column. So thank you. We spent quite a bit of time on that um, in in our community meetings. That contributing column means that we are that supplemental concentration funds are contributing to this action. So forty one thousand dollars of supplemental concentration funds are being contributed to MTSS or at least that's what we're budgeting. Um, that's about closer to the figure that we spent this year. We over budgeted for that last year because again, we found a way to work with our county partners and reduce the cost to the district. You will, as we go through, you will see um, there is actually one column that says yes and no. That's because some funds are contributing through supplemental concentration and some funds are not. And then you will see some, especially in goal five, which is a new goal um, that uh, is not, Supplemental concentration funds are not contributing to that, to that goal. Um, okay, so students asked for additional opportunities for before and after school clubs and programs. They were really excited about the opportunities they had this year, and they want more. They don't want them to go away. Um, they wanted they wanted more sports. They want more equipment and that type of thing. So if you look, um, oh, Dave, I'm sorry. Can you go to the next slide? You want me to? You don't have a clicker, right? You want me to click it? Yes. Um, so if you look at the before and after school um, intervention enrichment clubs, we changed that wording just a little bit because it was before and after school intervention, but based on student feedback, we added um, clubs as well. Um, so, and then we, and then, yeah, so the contributing fund was about 60,000. So it, does, it didn't really change much there. Um, okay, action 1.5. So we're looking at um, supporting staff who implement and train uh, for the um, uh, train our other staff members um, so that we can comply with our English learner master plan. So we really took a good hard look at this because we had some funds contributing to this, but um, but because the 
the person that wrote the master plan left and we had a new person come in and I, we were kind of splitting that work up amongst different people because the position went away. We were really looking at what does the master plan say? What is the need? And so as you recall, I brought that master plan to the board um, last month. And so um, in that master plan, we added some uh, items and then we funded those items so that we could actually do them. And we funded them through this supplemental concentration. VAPA funds were added to fund our VAPA staff. And Janine's smiling because the students love VAPA. They could not stop telling us every school wanted more VAPA. Um, guided reading was decreased because we we got to the point where everybody that needed training and wanted training had training. Our coaches are highly trained. And so we have in-house training for any new teachers that come in or anybody that wants a refresher. We do not need to contract that workout. Um, guided reading is a supplement. It's not core. And so we wanted to make sure that anyone who wants to use it has access to it, but we don't have to fund that through this, this um, funding source. Uh, and then we have... Um, class size. So we're really looking at making sure that we can support um, the class size ratios. And so we wanted to, um, to go ahead and add that. This was actually an action that was in the LCAP the first year, and then it was taken out. We went ahead and put that back in. Okay. Goal two. So this is creating positive learning environments. Thank you, Dave. Uh, so we looked at increasing the library and media centers. We put some extra money in there. We want to make sure that our libraries are able to serve as the hub to our schools um, where teachers can take their classes in and um, do activities and have access to the resources there where um, our library technicians, when they're on duty, can uh, read to kids or, you know, do activities, show kids how to check books out, that type of thing. So we added some funding to this. Um, we also... Um, added funding to the, it, it was the middle school vice principal, but as you know, last month we changed that to itinerant uh, vice principal position. And so we increased that funding based on COLA. Um, same thing with middle school counselor. And then for transportation, we wanted to make sure that any students who needed to um, utilize public transportation would be able to get um, that paid for. And so we, we, Heather and I, we, uh, we talked to the city and they did tell us that there is public transit available for our schools, particularly um, in North Auburn. And so we wanted to make sure that we can get vouchers to our families. I don't know that we're going to spend as much money as we put in. What we did was we really crunched the numbers and tried to make sure that any student, any unduplicated student who needed to access would have access. And then we'll see how that, you know, how that goes. Okay. Um, goal. Okay, Dave, we can go to the next goal. Okay, so these all pretty much stayed the same. That I don't have much else to comment on these. I'm just pointing out those differences to you. So we can go to the next one. Sorry, Dave. So parents, families, um, and community engagement. So we added some money to our community liaison program, um, basically to cover the cost of COLA and um, supplies and materials if needed for the program. And then our com community partner engagement, which is the next slide. We, we change a little bit of the language there just to make sure that we're covering all the things that we're doing, such as family university and those types of events. And then um, we added some money to that as well. Okay, goal for recruit, hire, train, and retain staff. So professional development, we went ahead and continued with the cost um, of professional development. We believe that this is um, great for our staff, um, highly qualified, highly trained staff, um, and to keep our staff here. And then um, school psychologist, the language was modified to better explain what we got feedback from the community who would read the plan for the first time in some instances was they didn't understand really what that what that um, action meant. And so we cleaned up that language a little bit. It made it a little bit more understandable. And then goal five. So this is the, the extra goal we had to add for um, to be in compliance. And um, this is for our students with disabilities to ensure that we are supporting them and improving their outcomes as well. So um, you will see here, these are not contributing. 
So they're still part of the plan, but the supplemental concentration dollars are not contributing to this. So we added in a program specialist position, as you know, I, I've mentioned before, to support our students with disabilities and our um, special education department. And then we um, added some money for professional development. So going back to that, so we have some money in the EEBG grant for that, but we also have some more money here. So we're gonna make sure we get that professional development component covered and we can support our staff to support our students. And those are the highlights. Any questions? I don't think it's more of a question. I got really excited to see the transportation on there. Um, I actually even started looking at the schedule and coordinating and it made me really excited to see. I can't wait. Remember to introduce your name. This is Trusty Dowd. Thank you. Um, this is Trusty Ross. And you had mentioned that there was um, extra money added for COLA. That was for the community liaisons. But yes. our teachers, none of that, none of the COLA money goes to like how do the the teachers that money is totally different it's separate to fund that yes. has nothing to do with this separate fund specifically the community liaisons, liaisons. yes okay. Just yeah the so the positions listed in the plan are funded out of the plan ex with the exception of goal five that position is not but um that's funded with block grant money Gosh. so our regular teaching positions are general fund and Heather can add. Uh, correct. Sorry, uh, CBO Heather Leslie. Um, so essentially, these amounts were changed this year to reflect the cost of living increases that were given um, this last year in negotiations. So we needed to make sure we reflected the increased salaries of any positions that were included in the plan. Thank you. Um, Trustee Brickler, so I noticed when I looked at the budget that we're budgeted to be um, at 55% for unduplicated students. So we're like right on the threshold, right? And yes. So if we were to dip below in the course of this upcoming school year and that ratio were to um, decrease, does that mean that we might receive fewer LCAP or the, the supplemental and concentration funds that we use to fund the LCAP? Yes. So this could be a moving target, what we're trying to um, budget in this LCAP plan or the things that are yeah, and 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 that and that's the hard part about about the work that we're doing because we really start planning, you know, in January, really December, you know, but January, you know, that time of year for the next year. But we don't know, um, you know, until students show up, and then census day is in October. So we have all the way up until then to really know what our numbers are. Yeah. So yeah, it it does make it difficult. We're projecting, and and we're you know we're trying to get to the closest dollar amount we can because that's just best practice. But like I said, we had to make some revisions because as we're going through, if we see a way to save money, we're going to take it, and then we just have to explain that later. So in the LCAP plan, which is a lot of pages long, um, and which uh which will be a is, should be attached to the um, to the agenda. Actually, in that plan, uh, you will see the narrative for the difference in expenditures and the difference in budgeting. Um, to the new trustees, we we learned um, last year that we had dipped below the fifty five percent, and all of a sudden we had to adjust our um, our planning because I think we were down maybe one point three million or something. Yes. It was really it was quite significant. So I guess I just wanted. I'm just feeling very very cautious after reading yes. our budget documents. Absolutely. And, and so there and, is, we could, if we needed to adjust where the supplemental and concentration funding goes, right. That we could update our LCAP if we needed to, if we were in a dire financial position. The, the way that the way the LCAP would work is that we have the plan for the year. It's our projections. It's what we're budgeting. But as the money comes in or doesn't come in, then we adjust on our end and we're like, ooh, that training we're going to do, let's pause that or let's, you know, um, let's rethink something that we're doing that we can, right? Um, we can't rethink everything because the positions, you know, we have for the year. And so we're always monitoring where we are with our, our funds, as Jeremy probably could attest, I'm in his office all the time asking questions just to make sure that I'm on track when I'm doing planning. And that's because things can change. Um, but typically by census day, we know our numbers and then we have our, our funding, of course, you know, then we have, you know, there's, there's a lot of factors, but we we're watching. So, does that answer your question? 
does. Thank you. So census day is October, October that range. The 8th, 10th, 8th. Yeah, and yeah, there you go. It is. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Next will be um oh, sorry. <clears throat> This is President Holt. Uh, great. So moving forward then to item 9B, the 2023 LCAP uh, self-reflection. So I didn't put together a presentation for this because it's pretty um, straightforward. So last month I or last week, last board meeting, I talked about the federal addendum and, and how we had to look and see how we're doing and write to that. The local indicators are similar. So um, we we annually measure our progress internally as well as the state annually measures our progress so the state measures our progress and posts the results on the dashboard which i presented on the dashboard data a few months ago this is our own district's internal self-reflection on where we are with meeting our local indicators so this um we write this up we submit it to the state they go in and they um, they click that we've met. So when you see they have met in the California dashboard for each of these indicators, which would be priority one, two, three, six, and seven, you can go on the California dashboard and see we've met those. What that means is we provided the narrative. So they don't judge whether or not we're meeting standard or not meeting standard. They're just saying we met the deadline to self-report how we're doing. So this is really a good way for us to look at the work we're doing and see how far we are along. And, and honestly, it's a great exercise for our team because sometimes we feel like we're further away from where we want to be until we sit down and we really look at these, um, these self-reflection templates. So I'm just going to, um, Dave's just going to kind of roll through. So this is just all verbiage that you're going to see on the website or whatever. That's part of this template. There are a few areas. Keep going, Dave. Please, I mean. Okay, so yeah, so a little bit more down. And so this is the first area where we self report. And this is, um, if you look at facility conditions, that's the number that I had to change because we had one in there, but actually our, we have zero in, um, in um, facilities that don't, that do not meet good, re good repair. So I changed that and I gave you the amended copy and I put a copy out for the public as well. So that's just that self reflection. Yeah. Ross, was that just a mistype or was that because we actually went back and did the work and realized it was? Yeah, so um, that's because we typed that in a while ago and then I didn't go back to update it. Okay. So we got into the, the narrative piece and we got really intense on that. And then I was going to go back in and change it. And I realized today when I was looking at the print copy that I didn't. Beautiful. Thank you. So um, as Dave just kind of scrolls through, and, and Dave, just feel free to just scroll through this, this next one a little bit, you're, you're going to see how we've ranked ourselves. So when, when we talk about teaching standards, um, we ranked ourselves in the fours, um, fives in some areas, and then threes in others. And that's because we're really looking at how far into implementation we are. So in other words, um, are we teaching the standards? Do we have the you know curriculum that teaches, that helps teach us and the tools, right? So Really, curriculum is the standards. The tools are how we teach the standards, but that's often misunderstood. So I'm just going to say curriculum for now. Um, so are we doing that? And so here's all the ways that we decided we actually are meeting these standards. We have um, professional development days for the curriculum, and we have um, uh, trainers, and we have new adoptions, and um, we've had publisher trainings and that type of thing. So when we looked at that ranking piece, um, that's why we ranked ourselves in fours and fives in some areas. There are other areas such as NGSS, and you, you can stop there, Dave, for, but thank you, and such as NGSS that we were just getting started in. And so that ranking will be just a, a slightly lower. And then, sorry, Dave, I said scroll, and then um, could you just go back um, words? Okay, and uh, let's go to priority two. So one more. There we go. Perfect. So this is all part of that um, that ranking you can see here, and then the PD. Thanks, Dave. Okay, good. So um, recently adopted academic standards curriculum framework. So that this is what I was referring to, um, and then 
Dave, you can scroll again. It's going to be a pain. I'm so sorry. Okay, and then one more. Okay. So again, here, this is what I'm referring to that the NGSS and the history of social science because we just purchased and implemented. And so we're saying in implementation, this is where we are. Okay. Could you please, Sarah Brinkler, right could you please explain when there, when you see a five, for example, um, I saw one up above regarding right. math, for okay. example, under number two, there were, mm -hmm. there were a couple of them, but let's just pick one. Sure. There's um, math and BAPA. I see BAPA so, right here. So yeah, rate your progress and in making instructional materials aligned with um, recently adopted academic standards available. And so um, we got a five, which is implementation, full implementation and sustainability for ELA and math. Yes. So can you just explain like how sure. we're um, setting ourselves apart in those areas as opposed to having full implementation fours and others? Absolutely. So um, go, going back to, I, I'm going to go back to, to our threes as well, where I, where I talked about how we just purchased and are implementing. Our math has been implemented for many years now, and there's been a lot of training around it. Maybe not in the past, but there has been recently. Um, and and so that that is fully implemented. Teachers are using it you know, and, and so go math is our thing, um, to, to put that in not very professional terms, apparently. <laughs> um, but, and VAPA is the same way. So our VAPA is really on track. We have our VAPA standards outlined. We have, um, our VAPA teacher has a structure for how we're, um, how students are accessing VAPA. And we have that alignment all across TK through eighth grade. So we feel that we're implementing VAPA very well here. Um, so those are the two fives there. And then the world language we're starting to implement. We're, we're in that beginning implementation by having um, Spanish. So we have a Spanish club. Um, we had a Spanish club this past year. We have a Spanish teacher at Evie Kane. And so we feel like we're in that, um, the initial implementation stages of world languages. And, you know, so we'll continue to monitor that as well. So I know that we're considering a math uh, new curriculum adoption in the next couple of years. So it's because we've we're getting a five here because it's been several years since we adopted, implemented, it's fully trained, implemented. Yes. But then the life cycle starts again soon. Yes. Right. The life cycle of the curriculum. Okay. Yes. What's the standard number of years that you I have, have to look it up? Okay. Um, I don't it, mean it's to different ask. for different, and I can't remember right now. Yeah. But I just, it's like let, ballpark, like five years, seven years, something. I'm thinking eight. 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 Okay. Thank eight you. Eight comes to mind, but I'll look. I'll send you an email. Okay, so parental involvement and family engagement, this is priority three, and you can scroll, Dave. This time I'll tell you when to stop. <laughs> okay, so let's stop here for a quick sec. Okay, no, it's fine. Yeah. Um, so, so if we look at developing the capacity of staff, we feel that we are, um, that we're implementing that full implementation. Um, and and I'm, I'm saying um, Sustainability is probably just around the corner, but I feel like we're at full implementation right now. Um, we are providing PD um, and we have our PD days built in and we're providing conference style PD. This last year, we we during our PD days, we had to do publisher type of training. And I say had to, it was good. Our staff needed it, but we like um, conference style training because we feel like there's something for everyone there. We're gonna get back to that next year. Um, and then uh, creating welcoming environments for families based on what our principals have reported. Um, maybe some family universities didn't have a lot of attendance, but some did. And families coming to back to school nights, families coming to student conferences, that type of thing. So we're looking at the whole picture where, you know, we see areas where we can grow, but we see areas where we're doing really well. So we're not quite at sustainability yet, but we're, we're working that direction. Um, and then, and then the goal, yeah. Okay, let's see. Oop, right there. And then building partnerships. Uh, we have some great partnerships going on here, and we have um, long, long-term partners. And so we feel that this is something that we, um, that's sustainable year after year. Um, and then uh, policies and programs for teachers and um, supporting families to understand um, and exercise their legal rights. We feel that we provide that information to families and that families know who to reach out to if they need more support. Thanks, Dave. Okay, right. Yeah, we'll, we'll just, we'll stop at these, then I can talk about them. Okay. 
Perfect. Um, seeking input for decision making. Um, we're, we were excited this year to get the student voices going, right? To, to be able to seek. So, you know, having community engagement is, is good. Having communi community engagement and parent advisory committees is great. And then you add students and I and we, we feel like we're making really great strides. And so what we want to do is just continue that along and make that something that we can eventually say, no, we're doing this very well and year after year. Thanks, Dave. Um, on that point, this is Sarah Brickler. I just, I, I think it's one thing for the, you know, this is the district's self-assessment, right? And so um, there's the item about seeking input that uh, the district rated itself a five, which is full implementation and sustainability. And that's rating the LEA's progress and providing all families with opportunities to provide input on policies and programs and implementing strategies to reach and seek input from any underrepresented groups in the school community. And I know we're being translated this evening, which is a, a step in the right direction. Um, I guess I guess my only hesitation when I see something like this is that these two things can exist simultaneously where the district says, we've made a lot of progress in this area and we're doing well. And then sometimes the families still may feel like they don't have a lot of opportunity. So I guess I just wanted to urge us to try to find ways to um, bridge that so that there isn't a gap between how the district may feel compared with how families may feel. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. I think sometimes you can be doing, making a lot of efforts that may still be unseen or it's, it's just challenging to reach families. Sometimes we get so much communication and you, then you're picking and choosing, what am I going to pay attention to? And Sure. And, and, you know, what, what I'm really, what I'm referring to is, you know, so we have our sites that have their site councils, they have their ELAC, they have their coffee with the principal meetings, they have dances and, and dance clubs and all kinds of, you know, of, of, um, of events and activities. So um, in many of those, there are opportunities for families to give input, right? Um, at the district level, we have DLAC and we have, you know, um, uh, just, well, we have DLAC and I can't even, Oh, LCAP. Thank you. I knew there was something. It's yeah. really hot in here. Um, we have we have the the LCAP and community engagement and that type of thing. We're working on the resource fair to increase, um, you know, participation from families as well. But but really, when when we look at this from a district level, we're really looking at you know all the components of the district, not just um, what the district team does, because what our sites are doing is part of our strategic plan and our LCAP and our local indicators. And all of that is what drives um, the LCAP for us. And so let's say um, a few years ago, if we didn't have you know, as many opportunities for families, then we took a look at that and we started increasing those opportunities. That's how Family University was, was born, right? Um, that's how principals started boosting their coffee with the principal and increasing how often they do it. And so if, you know, when, when we look at that data, it's, it's really looking at all the sites and some of the, of the district level. Um, engagement as well. We're always looking for more ways to engage our families and get input. Not everybody wants to put input into a survey. Some just want to call and meet. Some want to come to a listening session um, or, you know, um, formerly called town halls, now called listening sessions where they can just voice their opinion. And so we are absolutely looking to increase those opportunities because we do want to hear from all of our families. That's how we are able to write an LCAP that serves all of our students. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, then priority um, seven is access to a broad course of study. So this is just that our students have access to the courses of study that they need to have to be able to move through their grade levels and then into high school and then on to their career of choice, whether it's to go to college or a trade school or whatever they want to do. Our job is to give them access Right. And so we're making sure that we're providing that. And so we provide that through, of course, the core subjects and um, VAPA as well, and some of the opportunities that we have um, at our middle school for students. And then there are two other indicators that are county indicators only, and we don't report on those. Oh, okay. Any other questions? Yes. Um, Trusty Ross, I'm just curious, who's on your team for self-reflection? Like who's on this team that you sit together in a group and so we have all we have our ed services team. So we have the people that are out of the schools um, in, in the field. 
And then we have, um, we, we seek in um, input from our principals as well through our principal meetings and that type of thing. So we gather information. It's not like we sat in a room and wrote this at once. You know, we go out, we gather information, we bring it back from our leaders that are doing the, the work. Thank you. Okay, thank you. This is President Holt, thank you. And moving right along to Item 9C, presentation of the 23-24 AUSD proposed budget. Good evening, uh, President Holt, uh, Interim Superintendent Lucci Garcia, members of the board, um, audience, um, CBO Heather Leslie here um, with a, a quick review of the proposed budget for 23-24. Um, before I get started, I want to go ahead and recognize that Jeremy McReynolds, our district accountant, is here. Um, lots of hours of Jeremy's time has gone into um, all these tiny adjustments as we work through um, I think everybody in the in the room and probably listening is aware that we are still under letter of going concern with Placer County Office of Education. Uh, with that, we do have a fiscal expert that is assigned to us. So all items um, such as budget or anything have been uh, reviewed through our fiscal expert, Dennis Snelling, as we've gone through this process so that it can kind of match up where um, he feels he wants to report to the County Office of Education. So. We've been um, kind of working very closely with Dennis over the last few weeks to not only get Dennis to a point of um, a comfortable position um, with second prior second interim numbers, uh, moving into a third interim for 22-23, but also looking at how this affects our 23-24 uh, budget and then projections from there on out. So what did we get out of the May revision? So as you guys have seen a lot of these presentations come through, we try to capture as much as we can from the information that we're given. So generally we have an original budget proposal that comes in in about January. You guys hear us talk about that when we come in for second interim in March. And then come May, we get what's called a May revision. And that even now to this date is, you know, to speak to um, when interim superintendent Lucha Garcia was uh, up here talking about some of the time frames um, as we worked on LCAP, you know, we, we have to project here, we're not really going to know until we get enrollment in, and then we basically flow right back into planning and it, it, it's very similar in this instance instance. So right now we're looking um, from the May revision, uh, the cost of living adjustment uh, is looking to be a steady 8.22%. There was some discussion if it was gonna come up from 8.13, if they were going to partially fund it. Right now we're looking at a fully funded cost of living adjustment of 8.22. The state is looking to balance its budget and um, education with some reductions to state one-time block grants that were essentially given to us in this last year. Um, arts, music, and instructional uh, block grant. Um, we have received approximately 50%, um, about half of what is considered to be our apportionment. And right now the state is looking at not continuing to apportion out funds. So uh, the plan was written for a little bit more. This is where we would have to adjust. Uh, same thing with the learning recovery block grant. That actually, we have most of the money that was given to us to the, by the state. Right now they're looking at reductions of approximately 32%. That means that they're going to have to come up with, in some trailer bill language, how they're going to recoup that money. Um, I have seen it, not my words, the phrase claw back the money. Um, we're in a better position here in Auburn Union in the fact that the arts, music, and instructional block grant was written out um, from the Educational Services Department to go over that full three years. And we've just started some expenditures in 22-23 um, as we've gotten the plan solidified and looked at it. So really it becomes an adjustment of what can we cut off from that last year and what haven't we spent and how do we adjust those? So it's something we'll be looking at in the coming year once we have this solidified. As far as the learning recovery block grant also, 
making sure that we were spending that appropriately. That one did not require a plan to be approved, but we have expended very little of that money at this point. So what we're looking at, and as you may see um, in some of the budgeting documents, is we're kind of looking at holding that money aside so that we, we know that it's just waiting for the state to take back at some point. Um, yes. Trustee Ross, yes. if we hold it, is there any risk to losing it if they don't recoup it? Would we end up losing it or we're automatically like, hey, we know what we're going to spend it on? <laughs> we, would, we wouldn't lose it. If they, for any reason, decide they're not going to take it back, then we can just kind of roll it right back into our regular budget. Thank you. So that becomes great. We already have it, so they have to come get it somehow. Um, more than likely, I would anticipate at some point them just reducing an allocation of our local control funding formula. Um, that seems to be a way they don't even have to expend it. They just send us less money. Of course, I haven't seen that language yet. This is all just speculation at this point from the state. Uh, another big piece that they were kind of debating if it was going to go back and forth was the continuation and fully funding of the extending learning opportunities program. So that's the extended day or the after school before school programs you hear in different forms or ELOP. Um, and then also continuing with the universal meals. So back into this great subject of the budgeting and the state calendar. So we got the May revision on May 12th. Uh, right now, June 30th is, is the hard deadline for all districts to make sure that their budget information is submitted to their county offices of education. We're supposed to have a state budget around June 30th. Uh, just on the 11th, the legislator um, sent out what they consider to be a proposed budget. Um, however, it said in many of the reportings from both CSBA and school services that this is their proposal, um, which counteracts a lot of the governor's proposals. So they're looking to possibly have to, quote, battle it out. So this might be one of those years that we don't see a budget, a state budget actually adopt until after their July 1st deadline. Uh, December 2023, the state obviously will have our CBEDS time in there where we'll kind of be able to see, it's not CBEDS anymore, but our enrollment and attendance date of October. Um, so we'll get a little bit narrowed down as to what our enrollment is and kind of see where our, our average daily attendance landing. Um, the state will start getting in um, all of their December taxes, as we all know, and we've talked about before, tax revenue has dropped in the state. And that's why they're starting to look at how can we kind of keep back some of this money? How can we cut programs? Um, so we're probably actually not going to see a determination on how bad of a state the, dis the state's in until like January, uh, when we're already past our first interim. And as in interim superintendent had mentioned, you know, starting our new planning, um, that's when we're going to start seeing whether or not we have any surplus or any deficit at a state level. Um, this has not been officially proposed in any way. I just want to make sure everybody is very prepared of the fact that last time that they had a situation like this in the state of California, about 2007, 2008, 2009, what they did was uh, deferred revenue. So they did deferred allocations. So they just basically said, we owe you X amount of money for this fiscal year that ends on June 30th. We're going to pay you your last amount in the next fiscal year. So they just didn't pay districts. So Typically, this will affect a district's cash flow, and uh, we um, can apply for what's called dry period financing or pass-through financing from the county treasurer. A lot of districts just do this automatically. There hasn't really been a need for Auburn Union to do that. We've been able to meet our cash flows and not run negative even last year. Um, however, this year you will see that in your final budget submittals that go to Placer County Office of Education, an application for that just because I do kind of have that concern if they decide to defer that money, it could impact our cash flow. So we want to make sure that the county treasurer is covering us. So any big changes since 22-23? So this is one where changes in between budget or how we're going along really becomes more of an interim per interim. Each new year is, an, is a new budget in itself. Different programs, different way we're structuring accounts. But some of the things that you may notice in there is obviously supplemental concentration monies. We're going to be start coding that a little bit differently. So that's going to have a separate resource code. It's still going to be under the general fund. But what that allows us to do is take the monies that are identified in uh, the LCAP and kind of give it its own resource. So when that money comes in, we deposit it right into there and we can expend right out of it. It's going to be a lot easier to track as we start doing some of these LCAP accountings and then also allows us to kind of reserve that so we we can more so see that it's not ending up in the, it will still end up in the same bucket. It's gonna be in the in fund balance. It's just that as we look a little bit deeper into those reports, we'll be able to see, well, we have like, you know, a million left. 
but 500,000 of it is actually our supplemental concentration that's committed to the LCAP. So we really only have $500,000 to play with. Um, we obviously have less expenditures from our COVID funds. We still have a lot of ESSER 3 money, which is uh, hanging around that we're continuing to spend down and we have until September of 2024. So we have some time. Um, however, that income's not coming in like it used to be and we're pushing those expenditures out as fast as we can. So as we start getting into those out years, that's where all those funds have expired. One-time block grants, obviously with the cuts are gonna be expended and we're gonna start seeing our revenues really drop and also all of our expenditures drop at the same time. And again, as we said, you know, expected uh, reductions in revenue and um, we may have to reimburse funds for learning recovery. So what does that 8.22% really mean for Auburn Union? Um, this is something that has come forward to you guys in other interim reports and also as we've talked about in negotiations. And this, I think, gives a little bit of a clearer picture. It's easy just to say we're going to take 8.22% and pop it onto all of our incomes, you know, whether that be special education grant monies or mandated block grants. But what does it really mean when you're in declining enrollment or you have a reduce in average daily attendance that we're funded on? So if you see here, our funded ADA, which has a, an asterisk on it, um, again, we're funded right now under the three-year rolling plan for average daily attendance. So our daily attendance is down here, but we'll get funded on an average of the three prior years. Good news is, as we talked about before, that th that was the state's way of really trying to keep everybody off that fiscal cliff that everybody talked about. Now it's more like a fiscal ramp. It's more like a slow decline to try and give people a chance to catch up. So as those lower ADAs get wrapped into those prior years, that's where we're going to start to see that that funded ADA come down. And if we get to a point where actually our three years prior is less than what our current ADA is, we can always take our current year. So that gives us some options in how we to get that money in. Yes. Trustee, Trustee Brickler, could you please share the copy of the presentation with us? Because I think it, it's presented differently than, than, than it reads in the report. Okay, yeah, absolutely. In fact, that's um, posted publicly too, but I'll go ahead and email that out. I thought it was the two budget, doc, like the prior budget document. When I looked earlier today, it should have it should have been the revised and then the presentation, but okay. I'll send it out anyways. So as you can see, our funded ADA previously was at 1513. We anticipate our funded ADA based on enrollment projections to be approximately 1406. So while the base grant has gone up per student, and this is an average because really it's different for TK through three, you know, four through six and seven through eight, but this gives you an average of base grant per student. And you can see our total funds coming in really only net an increase of about $51,000 because of that reduction in enrollment average daily attendance. So really our percentage change of increased revenue is about 1%, not a flat 8.22. And this was very similar to last year where we had almost a 13% increase in cost of living because it was both on the base grant and then the cost of living adjustment. But really we netted somewhere close to about 9%. So same type of theory, just way less of a cost of living increase. So this is, is, is a terrible line graph, but it does give you an idea. And this was straight kind of from our, our demographer study, but it, it's an accurate depiction. So you can start to see where this line is the average birth rates or what they, and then they have some projected birth rates. And this is just for people within the area codes of Auburn. So we're looking at 95603, 95602. We might have some outliers, but this gives you a general idea of what the registered births were. So as you can see, we're pulling information in from 2018 to kind of project five years forward. Obviously, this isn't going to capture TK. That's a little bit different, but just trying to capture how many kindergartners could we possibly expect. This is just one piece of a projection puzzle that comes down to how do we figure out how many kindergartners we're going to get? Most of the time, you can kind of figure an average of we've gotten about X amount. We're going to get about that many. Um, this gives you an idea of just how many births came in and how they go forward. Now, if you notice in 2019, there was a little bit of a dip. It ticks up, kind of goes average, and then we're expecting in the out years, it's going to start dipping down some more. So why it says 23 down there, that's going to be, those are the kids we're going to see five years later. And to give you an idea of what our capture rate is from births versus how many enrollments we actually have per CalPads, um, we were pretty much holding strong somewhere in the 40s. Um, I'd seen documentation that said we capture about 50% of the birth rates. Um, if you look at actually 2018 to 2023, um, we're anticipating we'll receive about 
27.95, so about 30%. So that's just kind of what we look at. Now we might have years that we get a little bit more, years we get a little bit less. We hope that with TK, that's gonna help out things as we go forward. But as an average, it, it gets a little bit dangerous just to say, we think we're gonna capture 50% of those birth rates. We're actually capturing a little bit less. So to give you an idea here, this is um, the current enrollment projections. This does not reflect anticipated enrollment as the teachers are, or as the principals and site administrators have seen it trickle in. This is just that we've, what we've projected. Um, in working with our fiscal expert, we kind of talked about, do we retain that old cohort survival where you see the big chart and like, usually we retain about these kids. And this is one of those years um, almost like when we originally opened Alta Vista or when we've had other charter closures, when EV Kane Charter School came on or when it came off, uh, you almost remove these types of years from your averages because it's just such an off year and it's so hard to predict what that cohort's going to look like. So it's recommended that we really just look at a holistic instead of grade by grade. So right now we're projecting an enrollment of approximately 1,412 students. As we take that and just go flat, as we talked about before, just projecting flat, no increases, and kind of messing with the cohort and kind of imagining we're gonna have a little bit less enrollment. Um, we actually go down to about 13, 14 in 24, 25, and 25, 26, about 1,264. Now, a big piece of this drop is we have a bubble of middle school students that came through that are in eighth grade as of 23, 24. So we'll still retain those students this next coming school year, but that bubble of students is going to come out. So we're going to see a, a pretty big drop as we as we go forward with that, just naturally um, in and of itself. And then after that, we're really going to have to see as we get into that October date as to where we really stand as far as enrollment. But we're continuing. I know it's um, a hot topic because as we're consolidating schools, you know, how many are we actually seeing? Um, we're starting to see a little bit of a tick up in elementary, which is great but a huge decline as, as far as middle school goes. So we're actually seeing much less middle schoolers enrolling and a little bit higher on the elementary. So I'm kind of hoping that those will at least balance each other out. Everyone's favorite slides. I really had to mess with this one because it was really blurry last time. So this is just a different look. Inside um, your packet, you have the multi-year projection, which comes from our, um, uh, SACS system, which is the statewide system. Now, the difference is that you'll see, as opposed to the originally posted one and this one, majoritively stand with the fact that the numbers that we were pulling forward on estimated actuals is was really taking from revised second interim. Once we finally got it completely aligned and we've gotten more of our numbers in, we we're able to pull better estimated actuals. So it's a it's a better picture of where we anticipate we're going to land at the end of this current fiscal year. The difference with that is we had a lot of unspent monies that kind of trickled through. So we ended up with a higher balance in estimated actuals. We also ended up with a little bit less in certificated salaries and um, some in the classified salaries because we have so many vacancies that we anticipated that we would fill throughout the year and we haven't. So we have to make sure that we're looping those back in, anticipating, of course, budgeting forward. They're still included in the budget going forward. It's just as we netted, we ended up with a little bit higher amount. So that kind of rolled through as you'll go. So um, this one, as I'm trying to wean a little bit away from these Excel type spreadsheets and go a little bit more into the official documents, that's why you'll see those in the official package, which is what they anticipate. We have to put that in the system anyways. And, but this, I think, gives a little bit of a, of a bridge as to being able to read it a little bit better. So as you can see, um, we're anticipating as we come through that we will still be deficit spending all the way through. Um, in 23-24, because of that higher netted ending fund balance, we end up a little bit better than what we originally thought. And as we go a little bit further into 24-25, we start to see some of those costs tick up. Um, and a lot of this has to do with expenditures that we know are coming. I know we just talked about curriculum adoption. We've assigned some funds for that. So those are going to be spent. So while it really kind of holds that we still have that money in our hands in 23, 24, we're expending it out in 24, 25, which is going to increase our deficit spend. We knew we were going to spend it anyways. It's just going to look bigger. But in the end, because of all the continued spending and the reduction in the revenues, we end up with a much lower unappropriated fund balance. 
And then in 2526, as you can see, we continue to deficit spend. That just keeps compounding, as we've talked about before, it just goes through. We're still ending positive and being able to make our 3% reserve, but our uh, unappropriate or unassigned fund balance is down to approximately $92,000. So we're still positive. Um, of course, any piece of this, as we said, it's always a moving target. If we end up with more students than we thought, this picture is gonna look different. If we end up not expending out the funds that we thought, this is gonna look different. If we end up you know, having way more vacancies even throughout the next year, this will obviously look different. So this is just the pie charts that we um, include, but this is one that everybody seems to like. Um, this is our unrestricted expenses. So this gives you a pie chart picture of kind of where the funds are being spent at. So if you were to look at these and in the packet, and it's not in the presentation, the restricted ones, we have a bigger slice that are books and supplies because that's all that one-time funds that we're you know, not using them for ongoing expenditures. We're using them for books, supplies, services. That looks bigger in restricted, but in unrestricted, you can see the majority is really salaries and benefits. This year, we're anticipating contributions from the unrestricted general fund. We're looking at special education being approximately 4.3 million. We have our required 3% contribution to routine restricted maintenance. It's about $700,000. And we um, have taken down the contribution to deferred maintenance fund 14. So this is for our larger repairs down to $150,000. This has been removed in out years uh, just for fiscal conservancy. However, it is something that should we find that we're in a better position than we thought that we should really consider doing. Um, we don't have uh, a whole lot of other uh, capital funds income that come in. And this is really our funds to make improvements to buildings, roofs, um, heating and air conditioning systems, carpet, floors, anything of that nature. And now um, I'm going to have Jeremy come up and explain some of the differences and why you see increases to the contributions. So the contributions, again, have both to do with routine repair and maintenance, which is always going to be your 3% required. And we always see the fluctuates in the special education. So we anticipated some increases and we have some decreases and increases, but this will give you an idea of the net. So I'm going to have Jeremy present for the first time. Uh, Jeremy McReynolds, the accountant for the district. Uh, I've been here a year now, and this is uh, what I get into. I get into the weeds, into the details. And so we're, we're looking at projections uh, three years out. And so when we look at special ed, um, cost, the first couple um, lines up here are 164000 49000 What we're doing is we're saying we're going to fill those positions and we're going to not use as much contractors. So we're going to put $300,000 back into the budget for special ed. But we're going to have more bill back increase, more services that the county's offering. So it's going to cost $100,000 more. The uh, SELPA revenue is going to go up. So we're going to get more revenue in. And so that's gonna um, offset what we have to comp contribute. The transportation increases about $40,000 a year based on um, inflation. And then also the step and column and benefit increases. So for each year, we have to combine all of those changes and project based on what we think is gonna happen. And uh, for 25, 26, it goes into, um, you know, the same. We have about another $180,000 increase with the uh, PCOB e bill back and then the SELPA revenue adjustments decrease. So we're going to have to contribute more revenue from the general fund or unrestricted funds. So these are the types of things that we're trying to project three years out so that we can get a picture of where we have to make cuts or what we have to do to put us in a position of uh, good, you know, fiscal responsibility. Uh, Trustee Brickler, so the SELPA, um, or sorry, the PCOE bill back, that's, we are contracting with PCOE to provide some of the services. Is that what that? Correct, because we can't provide those special ed services. So we're anticipating that we'll try to bring some in-house so that we can avoid the um, contracted positions, which we know are at a much higher rate. So we'll use a mix of in-house um, hiring and um, contracting with PCOE rather than a, like a private 
entity? Correct. And I I don't know what type of students exactly. Um, maybe Heather or Jenny can answer. Uh, this is uh, Director Hughes. Um, yeah, so what we do, the PCOE bill back is for those students that need just more intensive services. And so it's kind of like the middle between um, our special day classes here in the district and then like a non-public school. So it's just a, it's more intensive kids. And so they provide services such as like medically fragile kids and things like that, that we cannot serve. Do they go into a PCOE program? Yes. Okay. So it's not, yep. P I was thinking it was PCOE staff was helping us. Mm -hmm. um, no, it's actually a, like okay. a special day class for those intense students. Okay. We owe PCOE money for enrolling our students in their programs. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And it goes up if we look. So we try and make the projection, projections a science so that we can base you know, our estimates off of what we've seen in the past and how we can predict what the future is going to be because you know, we're at a point where we need to you know, know where we're going to be. Uh, next slide, Dave. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the COVID uh, funding. And you can see that we've gone through quite a bit of it. The ESSER three, we have about a one and a half million. The ESSER two, we're gonna spend the remaining of that um, with some expenses here at the end of the year. Uh, we have until September to expend those funds. And then um, there's some more ESSER funds at the bottom that need to be expended, but they all run out in 2024. So we have a little bit of time and it's gonna help us uh, with our budget for the next year. All right, I'll turn it back over to Heather. May I ask, so Sarah Brickler, yeah. so there's the learning loss mitigation gear one. So that was about 25,000 that we were unable to spend by the deadline. Where is that at, right here? Um, It's one of the orange ones. No, we've expended it. That's, I'm oh. sorry, um, CBO Heather Leslie again. Um, this is a remaining receivable. So we've actually expended it. They haven't finished paying us for it yet. Oh, okay. So they still haven't paid us, even though the funds have expired. Okay. Oh, I should be looking at allocation <laughs> remaining then. Okay. So we have the, okay. I was like, the state the still owes us money on that. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's actually so pretty. We still common. have time for all the remaining. Everything has been spent down according to the deadlines. Correct. Thank you. And even with ESSER 3, we still have, and that's why you see some of those um, larger numbers for revenues in federal is because we still haven't even received all the allocations for ESSER 3, um, but we do have an expiration date of, you know, early next next fiscal year. So um, as you saw is um, we're still certifying positive in this budget certification. Obviously, you know, we'll need to see enrollment increases or significant changes at some point to avoid fiscal insolvency in 26-27. And um, we're still moving forward with a positive certification. So um, I'm honestly, it's a, a little bit of a better picture, not a great picture um, than what you guys saw in the very first draft. I think we were close to like 70 something thousand, closer to $80,000 in that third year as unappropriated fund balance. Um, this would have been higher. However, it was um, a consensus with a fiscal expert and County Office of Education that maybe we look at those more detailed of contributions and carving it in more so just to be, and there are, I mean, we had already put an increase each year into um, the contribution and then also the credit of not utilizing those contractors as much. However, it was thought to be on the safe side and be closer to the original numbers um, that they had kind of come up with that we go ahead and increase those contributions to get that third year a little bit closer to the original 78-ish thousand dollars that we had. I think we're ready for any questions. And if it's okay with you guys, I think I'm gonna move back to my chair so that I have my papers in front of me. Who wants to open up for questions? Uh, this is President Holt. Um, I guess I would just be interested, uh, have a request here skipping past you know, next week and all that. <laughs> if we could get some examples of what sort of uh, more or less austerity measures we can start looking at to try to stave off insolvency in 26, 27. 
what does it look like when we really try to get strict with uh, our spending? This is Sarah Brickler, and I have the same thought um, that I'm just incredibly concerned to see what a, a slim margin we're living in. I mean, I know it always, it, I think my experience here has been that things tend to look really bad in the third year out, mm -hmm. um, but I've never seen it look this bad. We've, we've been deficit spending for a long time, and um, it makes me very just deeply uncomfortable to um, to see that you know, beyond the 3% required reserve that, um, you know, we have so little money in our bank account to, we, we just, we can, we know how, um, so I think we're talking about $92,000 is remaining, um, mm -hmm. in the most recent projection. And we know, um, in education with the high cost of the, um, services we provide that that's so easy to spend that much money here. Um, on a, a roof repair or whatever it is. So um, um, I made a, a list of a couple of things that that popped up that I, I, I don't know that we can make these changes. I don't know what the timeline would be to make these changes, but I, I think as a board, we need to try to identify um, with administration what can be put on hold at the moment so that we um, aren't in such a precarious situation. Um, things like, the $150,000 deferred maintenance, um, whether or not we can consider waiting or using one-time dollars for things like math curriculum adoption or technology adoption, just a real like look at what can be shifted, um, whether we can afford um, a professional development program that I think it was like in the $300,000 range. I mean, these are all things that are really important that we're investing in a high quality education, but um, We've talked a little bit about the potential for some, um, you know, reorganization and whether or not there might be positions that could be considered, um, um, such as like the currently vacant assistant superintendent position. I just I think we need to be really aggressive about identifying areas that um, we put on hold that we you know that we recognize that they're important, but we don't have the money. But we're we're um, the that margin is just too slim. I think you're absolutely correct. Sorry, CBO, um, Heather Leslie. Um, and that's, I think, one of the things that always makes me uncomfortable. I know we've had prior discussions where it's like, wow, we've got, you know, $3 million at the end balance, you know, why can't we use more of that money for salaries or for this? And that's where you always saw me get really, like, oh, we kind of need that money because we're still deficit spending. And, um, you know, to point, um, even with the contributions, you know, one or two more non-public school placements um, can really wipe that, um, you know, one, you know, badly done lawsuit, one risk issue, um, can really wipe that, um, completely agree. The hard part is, is when we start talking about, you know, how can we conserve on a lot of those one-time funds, one-time funds are so strict on what we can spend them on, you know, um, even the ESSER three plan. See, I look at that and I see, oh man, there's 1.5 million we could do something with, but that was one particular pot of money. They were very strict on how the plan had to be written what metrics you have to hit, kind of like with the LCAP. So when you talk about professional development, that's great, but it's supplemental concentration dollars. So I still have to funnel that somehow and, and work with ed services. And how do we still meet those metrics that we have to meet and expend that only towards, you know, a certain population instead of district wide. And, and there are, I think, definitely measures we can look at. I know we've been talking internally um, already on how we can serve some of those and the $150,000 to deferred maintenance is, is also an area, and that's why it was pulled out. Again, just to note that we're already very slim on our capital funds that we currently have, and it, it would just take, you know, if we would have been someone who had a, additional snow, we could have had a roof cave in, and that would have been a massive repair, um, anything like that. And that's why I've, I've kind of tried to hold that money aside. I think if we get, like I said, an uptick in enrollment, that's going to change our picture a little bit, but we are really going to have to start looking at um, you know, how either do we, and honestly, you know, I might be rambling, but the district really has banked for so many years on, well, we're going to increase enrollment and statewide enrollment is not increasing. It's not just Auburn Union. So there might be ways that we can attract families back in or how we can, you know, kind of contract our programs or how we operate business here, um, between our current three schools. 
but it's it's really going to take something in, in a couple of years to really increase any type of enrollment with a shift in program. Um, and it's really just going to be a matter of making sure we're just very careful with how we expend our funds. Uh, Trustee Brickler, I just want to reiterate that I, 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 um, there's the two different, you know, you can either cut more costs and I know it always sounds draconian. All the things that I just mentioned are things that none of us want to cut, but then there's also the, how do you increase revenues and, um, it wouldn't solve all of our problems, but the only one that comes to mind immediately is if we were to be able to salvage the Alta Vista Charter and make it a homeschool program, that that could be a potential revenue stream to bring more students into the district. But over um, that doesn't solve our problems completely. But um, I, I want us to try to look at the two sides of the coin of mm -hmm. not, not just making cuts, but are there other ways to bring in revenue? And, and again, just to, to reiterate, you know, if, if for any reason there was a homeschool program under a charter, it would be under the charter. So the charter would be receiving the revenue and we would be receiving a percentage possibly of indirect costs. Interim Superintendent Lucha Garcia here. I just wanted to um, to say too that, you know, what something that CBO Leslie pointed out to the board was, you know, when, when we get these one-time funds, um, when when I go in to write the plan, and not that I write the plan myself, but I do oversee the writing of the plan and and I, I'm taking into consideration where we are right now, right? And so when I'm looking at spending money, I am stretching it out over the duration of the amount of time we can because I we never know if the state has to pull back funds, right? But I'm also looking at how can we maximize, we know our needs, how can we maximize and fulfill those needs with one-time funds? So I just I just wanted to point that out so that you're aware of that. That is part of, it's, it's a heavy part of the process because I'm always thinking about three years out, what will this look like? Can we, is it sustainable? Um, if, if I can do this for a couple of years, how far will it carry over, right? And so we're always looking for those creative solutions as well. Um, if it helps any, um, originally, as I worked through this budget, uh, we were looking at a position where we might possibly not make our 3% reserve in year three, and we would have had to probably certify as qualified. So I, I really am thankful that we were able to pull the full estimated actuals into the budget. And that was, that was some heavy lifting right there and kind of pumped those balances up. And again, you know, we, floating target. So when this comes back at first interim, if all of a sudden we've netted a ton of money and our enrollment's up, you guys might see a much better picture um, in year three. It's not going to be in the millions. We're not going to be swimming in it, of course, but it, it would definitely would give us a little bit more of a breathing room, maybe to like take, you know, one more notch loser on the belt, but, you know, not all the way. I, I just had a few um, small things that I saw that I like on, um, let's see, it's page four of the, well, the, the page numbers are tricky. Um, I thought it was page 20 of the PDF. There's, um, mm -hmm. um, in one case, our average daily um, attendance exceeded the seabed. So it's 108%. Can you just explain? I didn't think that that was possible. Maybe I'm misunderstanding. I thought that the seabeds data would always be higher than a ADA for some reason. It just some, some there were some things that popped out to me that, yeah, it, that could be that I didn't know if they would, they were an error or if I perhaps don't understand how the the relationship between the two. And I I can I can pull that really quick and look if I can find the page if I get a moment. But really the um <laughs> like it's this one here and it really is difficult. So as they've changed these forms for the state, the way these packets were put together are to have page numbers at the bottom, and there's no good spot to put them on those state forms because they take up both sides and the bottom. So I tried to adjust and on the PDF you can see the page numbers, but when this printed these copies, you you can't they could they're cut off at the bottom. Well, um, I don't want to take the time tonight, but no um I had a couple things like that that just didn't look right, like where well I'll, I'll, I'll actually let me get into one of them. Yeah. So I had it on page 28, but again, I think that that again is of the PDF document. So that's okay. I know that the narrative went through 11. So I, can I think it was about, um, there was a time where we changed the way that we assigned the un, like the reserve funds. Mm -hmm. And so in 2021, it looks like we had nothing in unassigned or unappropriated, but I think it was more that we had changed the way the numbers were, the dollars were classified. Remember how there was like a lump sum for reserve yes. and then you've been working to identify the kind of the sub 
groups within that. Yes. Um, so there was a couple of those instances. So to speak to that, um, I'm sorry, CBO Heather Leslie again. Um, I, do, I can't answer exactly what they did in 2021 because a lot of these numbers do auto populate from the state software system. However, I do know that there was a way that they assigned funding. I just don't know how it was assigned funding prior to me coming to the district. When I came to the district, I kind of backpedaled all the assigned funds to get a clearer picture of where our ending fund balance would be. Um, with that, it was it was kind of requested that we go ahead and put in in the assignments some of those anticipated costs like technology replacements and the curriculum adoption that we know are going to be coming. Um, so you will see a gap and, and that's where it's really tough because it'll say met not met and it'll have like a swing of like 100% sometimes and that's because back then maybe they didn't have the assignments and we didn't have them last year but now we do have the assignment so it's going to kick it way up. Right. So um, in 2021, it only showed that we had the, the reserve for economic uncertainties and it didn't show any other reserve. So it looks right. very small. Right. And then the two subsequent years, it shows the required 3% plus these three and $4 million um, reserve. So it's, it, it feels like it was kind of misleading. It looked like we had nothing in 2021 right. and then it grew by $4 million. So it's kind of a lot. Um, we were, as we were reviewing it again, um, Michelle Lucci Garcia and I, um, this afternoon, I said it It was very reminiscent, as I was explaining it, is almost like the FICMAT survey. It's like a click a yes or a no. And that's how a lot of the state systems are. Uh, for example, another one of those um, is the, I want to say it was like 600 and something thousand dollars. And it was um, in revenue that was in last year and then completely wiped for this next fiscal year, 23, 24. And all that was, was um, a very minor amount that came in from Alta Vista, which was a different um percentage for oversight that's completely different from indirect cost. And then their portion paid back for the mental health services. So basically it pulled in from one area and and paid off another area, but it just all of a sudden drops and makes it look like we don't have any of that revenue coming in. But that's where the explanations kind of tick in in a lot of areas. Yeah. And then one case it looked like in 27, 28, the County Office of, of Education enrollment was going to be 806. So there were just some numbers that, that looked um, like that they could use another look. Okay. Um, I know this is just a hearing tonight, so yes. we're not taking action until next week. So we have, would have some time to have a conversation about some of these. Yeah, absolutely. Um, how are we in terms of compliance? We had, we've had some ratios that have gotten us into trouble in the past, you know, ratios of like teachers to admin or, and what potential fines. So can you speak to um, kind of risks or you know, like some of those indicators that we're tracking to keep us compliant? Absolutely. Oh, bless you. So uh, CBO Heather Leslie again. So um, the admin uh, to teacher ratio, um, we've been doing that in now in August of every year. So this last year, we definitely were in compliance and we had to certify that with the auditors. Um, this year, we're actually reducing administrators. So we're going to be down by two administrators just because of the school consolidations. So we're going to be even even more within that tolerance, which is fantastic. Um, other ones that have been mentioned in letters, but um, haven't, you know, it's not really something that would be an audit exception or um, a FICMAT exception, is we talk about the expenditures to um, classroom salaries, um, which I think is form CEB in this packet. And that one takes into account not just unrestricted funds, but unrestricted and restricted expenditures. So as we kind of have reviewed before, this is one that's just gonna be skewed for us and for many other districts because of that influx of one-time funds. So instead of, it, it's, it, it's kind of, it's bad both ways. So if we were to take them and put them onto ongoing salaries, we're not being fiscally conservative enough because we're committing ongoing money with one-time funds. And we would honestly get dinged on that too. That's another box that I have to check on these criterion standards and a box that FICMAT had as well. Um, on the other side, if we don't utilize them for um, salaries or ongoing expenditures, we get the little tick that we're under the percentage. So I think we're about $2.7 million under the standard or where they'd like to see that on the form CEB, but again, that's because with those additional restricted one-time funds and expenditures, especially ESSER, it skews that percentage. Um, that's not a, an audit find or or anything that we would be fined on. President Holt, I just want to interrupt real quick. Director Peters, we're not on mute, are we? Okay, up on the screen, it looks like 
the blacked out one. Normally we see our picture back. Okay. Just wanted to clarify. Thank you. Trustee Brickler again. Um, could you explain why it looks like the LCFF revenue is non-linear? I like um I, I'm looking at the the original budget document, so mm -hmm. the numbers might be a little bit off, but I was looking at the unrestricted revenue. And in 23-24, it's you know 17.1 million, and then it dips down to 16.6 million the following year, and then it's up to 17.1 million again. And that just seems surprising to me because it seems like anything I would expect, um, like somewhat of a or just a trend one way or the other, like right. maybe a downward trend because we're anticipating declining enrollment. And this is based on the number of students enrolled. Right. And it's, um, sorry, CBO Heather Leslie again. Um, as you go through the LCFF calculator, and that was something that we really hashed out with our fiscal expert too, really making sure that we're tracking what we anticipate. So it really has a lot to do with the rolling three-year average and what's being pulled in. Um, the percentage of unduplicated because that's going to swing our supplemental and concentration and we see an uptick in that um, going on the out years because we will have a decrease in enrollment but this district historically um, in the past few years especially has not seen necessarily a huge decline in our unduplicated students so it's like as our enrollment comes up sometimes that percentage then goes down it's still the same number of students it's just the percentage but as our enrollment has declined like we saw at the end of you know, this fiscal year, um, our enrollment came down, but we saw the same number of unduplicated students. So it kind of bumps up our percentage a little bit. And then that kicks in additional concentration funds that you'll see in 25, 26. Thank you. Trustee Ross, um, we opened up this amazing preschool. Does th Are those funds contributing to our district funds in any way? Um, CBO Heather, are you talking about um, the preschool programs over at Rock Creek Elementary that are going to be going in? Yes. Okay, so um, perfect. So those are actually, we currently have Placer County Office of Education preschool program that was already operating on site. So they're staying. And we have a lease revenue that comes into our general fund already for them. So that's just ongoing. The um, Head Start or Kids Community or Placer Action Council, they've got like three different names that they function under. Um, was at Alta Vista Community Charter, Charter School. Um, that lease revenue was actually going to the Charter School Fund itself, Fund 09. They're looking to be moving at some point and we're basically committing to that same lease revenue and it will be going into our general fund. And so that will be captured into, I don't wanna say it's other other increases or transfers in, it might be in that line, but it's, we see increase in lease revenue. So also the, uh, lease revenue that we'll see from Blue Door uh, community will also be going into the general fund in that pot as well. And then my next question would be is um, what fund, because now we've just added new, this program specialist would be district office employees as opposed to like a specific school, correct? And then correct. do they come out of, is there like money set aside for that? Like, where's that money coming from? Because these are brand new positions. Where's that coming from? Well, this is kind of twofold. So um, it depends on how you want to look at the net. So for the program specialist, and, and catch me if I'm wrong on this one, for the, the new program, proposed program specialist that would kind of oversee the special education process, um, that is slated to come out of special education funds and is already built into these projections. Um, but second, as you guys may have heard, we also have quite a lot of build back. We have, we're over identification um, according to our FICMAT report uh, for our special education students. Um, we're really trying to rein in because we are very heavy. We have a very high special education population for Placer County even, um, you know, very heavy on IEPs as we've heard discussed from Director Hughes, uh, someone to really oversee that. We anticipate then that that will then tighten up, be the ability to tighten up that program and reduce those costs as well. So it's kind of like how we're going to end up netting. We're not we're not really exactly certain at this time, but the increases for that position are estimated in the projections going out. Do we see a potential increase in IEPs or is there any patterns that would cause us any just any more surprises? Uh, yeah, in our special ed education there's always a surprise in special education. There's always, I, I don't know, Director Hughes, do you have any insight on that you might want to add? 
This is Director Hughes. As CBO um, Heather Leslie said, um, it's unpredictable. It's really hard to predict special education. So it really just depends on, you know, students coming in, mm -hmm. um, if they've had early intervention. I mean, if students actually have early, event early intervention, they're more likely to get out of special education. Mm -hmm. So those students getting it in that infant preschool time. And so those are the just kind of things we look at. As far as increase in IEPs, it really just depends on the population. Um, you know, the one of the ideas with that program specialist is like CBO Leslie said, or Heather Leslie said, is just to really work on reducing those students that we have to place out and really increasing, you know, staff's ability to work with some of our um, really most challenged kids. Um, Trustee Ross, I, I read a recent article that said with the opening of more charters in private schools, we're going to have less of our students that may need extra help exit the system and more of our ELD students and our special ed students come into our district. Um, and so I guess that would be a future budget meeting, but <laughs> knowing that is coming up, are, you know, are there any precautions or exist or funds that maybe the federal government we're not paying attention to? Maybe there's a grant. I don't know. You might be the best one to answer that, Director Hughes. If you yeah, seen. this is Director Hughes. I mean, it's 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 really hard. I mean, we really have to look at the population that we work with currently and really look at their needs, right? I mean, there's there's certain students, you know, if they come into our district and they have, you know, let's just say like really intense medical needs, those aren't kids we can serve in our district. We just can't. We don't have that set up, and so those students automatically will get referred to a county program because we don't have that set up. On the flip side, we don't have enough of those kids to make a full classroom to make it, you know, fiscally make sense, right? And so that's where that challenge um, comes. I mean, this year, I think uh, we did well in creating that um, autism program, right? And keeping some of those kids, which we would typically place out to, to a county program, we kept those students in. And, you know, we're trying to grow that program to make sure that we can serve our students um, in-house. This is Interim Superintendent Lucha Garcia. Um, I, I also want to um, let you know that we're focusing on all of this through our professional development as well. And I know I've said that already, but I'm going to bring that back to center because, you know, as as we talk about serving our students, you know, are are they over identified? Um, our, our data will show that they are. And, um, you know, some of the ways that we can mitigate that is to provide more PD to all of our educators that serve students to really be able to differentiate and provide um, scaffolds and structures for kids so that we don't over identify. I just wanna add one more thing to that just because um, 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 in terms of Superintendent Lucci Garcia, it's hard, it's a mouthful, um, just mentioned professional development. So at the beginning of next year, for example, we have our psych team actually doing professional development on eligibility, on child find, on differentiated instruction and things like that to really help everybody understand what that means and how to kind of um, tease some of those things out that may look like say behavior, but maybe it's related to trauma and not a student with special needs. Uh, Trustee Ross, I, if I'm off topic, please let me know, but if, or maybe we need training on like, what's the screening process? Like, cause I know there was, if I can recall, I think we did like a screening process at Alta Vista. Um, it actually starts off with really the, um, I mean, MTSS process, but also our SST process, right? And so what we really try to do is to go through that SST process and provide interventions before we get to that place where we have to assess students. Now we are going to have those, those students that, you know, come through our door and you know, we're moving right to assessment, right? Because we, we know what's going on. Um, but it really just depends on the needs of those students, but we really do start off with that SST process. Process. And that's been really successful with a lot of our students is providing that intervention early and really, um, I will say, kind of gatekeeping and to make sure that we're not over identifying, but it's a work in progress. So I think that over time, you're going to see a reduction in that. It's just going to take time and some some hard work on everybody, including, you know, principals, leadership, you know, all of our educators and really working hard and being able to have those skill sets to apply into the classroom. So we're not over identifying kids. Sorry, last question, Trustee Ross. Um, our reading intervention is probably one of the greatest programs that I've seen. And has it been proving, is that actually saving us money? Is it, how's like, 
Are we seeing improvements? Are we saving money anywhere? <laughs> Michelle Lucci Garcia here. So, um, uh, the the reading intervention program is funded using Title I funds. And so what, what we do is the principals take the data to their school site councils. They determine the need. That program could change year to year depending on need. So if principals collect data and it shows that our students are reading, you know, and, and they want to spend title funds on a different type of um, program for students, then the site council and the principal determine that need. Um, and yes, I, in any kind of um, program that we can get in front of kids typically will help, but we do have to monitor the data because there is a point where it might not be helping as much anymore. And so we really need to, to look at how we're spending those funds. And trust you, Ross. <laughs> With our Title I funds, there is a new way now, right? Like there, uh, last year, Title I's fund went specifically to a school, whereas now they're going to the whole district, I think I heard you say, and how will that influence our budget and our funding? Yeah, um, Michelle Uchi Garcia. So um, title funds will be spent at all sites this year following the students that um, that the funds are created for, right? So our, our underserved population um, at all of our sites, the title one funds were at actually two school sites since I've been here. And, um, and then students, so, so if a school site had, you know, 50%, 52% and duplicated students, but they didn't receive title funds, then all of those students were not receiving a title funded program. And so by going district wide, now all of our students have access. Um, in the title uh, process, if you use the ranking system, which Auburn has historically used, then you can rank your elementaries first and then your middle later. And because not all of our sites, um, Alta Vista didn't have, they. Last year, they had 34% unduplicated students, so we had to stop the ranking and um, just fund the two sites that had the highest rank. We could not include Evie Kane in that ranking system because they're they're a middle school. And so, and so, just to get back to that title program, um, we are going to be hopefully improving student outcomes, which then hopefully will increase trust in us to educate students and maybe bring a few families back, as CBO Leslie said, um, but really support our students to get on to um, where they want to go in high school, you know, and, and then and then with their career, thus giving back to their community. So um, as long as there's data being used year by year, it's fresh data, it's being discussed and following all of the guidelines and compliance with the school site councils and those decisions are being made. So again, going back to our, the voices, community engagement, who's on the school site council, all of that goes through ELAC as well. And then it comes through, through DLAC for district wide. We're getting input based on data on how to best serve the community students. And that will support us in one way or the other fiscally. Um, I will let Heather though, talk about anything in the budget that's specific to some kind of a bucket of money, but overall, that's how those funds contribute. Trusty Ross, just to clarify, then you're saying now, like our middle school will receive reading intervention if they need it. They will receive um, a specific allocation of funds depending on um, their st the student population. So we've projected, Jeremy, we didn't, Jeremy projected. <laughs> Thanks, Jeremy. Thank goodness. Yeah, it was Jeremy, not me. Um, so D Jeremy kind of took a look at, you know, what he projects um, we will be able to give the sites. I talked to the principals and said, this is a projection. As you know, if we're down 100 students, your money is going to look different, right? But we're confident that we can run the programs that the principals put forth. So um, however, Principal Mayberry sees fit to spend the money as long as she followed all the compliance guidelines and had the parental family staff input then she'll tell me how she wants to spend the money and then I will um, take a look at it I'll look at her data I'll hear her rationale and then I'll make that decision that yes okay this is a good use of funds I have to watch over that a little bit because there are allowable uses and I don't want to misuse funds and then have to you know go through all that I want to go back, Sarah Brickler, back to the point that um, was made earlier about reducing expenses um, in this budget so that we have a better chance of remaining solvent in the out years. Um, what would be 
what do you propose as a time frame if we were at, if the board wanted to ask for further rejections? Would that occur during the forty five day revise, or um, what? When would be the opportunity? Because I know we have to have a budget in place um, by the end of this month. Um, CBO Heather Leslie again, um, and you know, catch me if I'm speaking out of turn on here, but. Um, Truly, I think that this is something, like I said, we've we've been talking at a cabinet level already as to what, and, and prior to even these numbers coming out here, you know, what are we looking at and for the future? Because we know obviously with declining enrollment, declining revenues are coming as well. So that's, you know, not a new conversation. Um, I think that we intended over this summer to really have a good look at some of the vacancies, like you said, some of the positions. I think we have um, some moving around that we can do. Um, I, and I'll let... Um, interim superintendent um, Lucha Garcia worked that out with the board as to a timeline of what they'd like to see, but I would really be interested to see where our October enrollment comes in and what that's starting to look like as the school year comes. And um, 45 day might be a little bit too soon because that'll have to come in before. So I'd really like to have a good hard look at this in first interim and then hopefully have some suggestions that come through from um, cabinet and, and from the interim superintendent on where we can move these things around and get a better picture and progress. And thankfully, we do have, you know, throughout the year to start making these changes as those, you know, doomsday looks about two years out at this point. To Sarah Bricker, to clarify. So for some reason, I was thinking that this could happen uh, um, sooner. But so are we locked into, um, let's say the $150,000 deferred maintenance, just to pick on that dollar amount. So we, that could, you just have to at some point transfer that money into a separate account uh, so that could still be pulled back i mean I, I guess i'm just thinking that some expenses are kind of fixed and set for the year once we approve this budget and others are you know could be reduced if need be you know it's hard because um sorry cbo leslie again um it feels weird to say my name every time when we're going back and forth i know um as much as I'd like to say a lot of these things are set and fixed, nothing is set and fixed. Um, this is going to look completely different um, when we run the audited, the unaudited actuals. And this is going to look completely different, possibly at 45 day if we have, you know, that information. So while well, like, let's just use 150 for an example, you know, we have that set aside, we don't even actually have to transfer that at this point, really. Um, so and it is something that if we journal down, I believe I, I want to double check with the fund, but I think deferred maintenance is one that we could journal back in again if we could show the auditors a string of what happened if it went out to another fund um i think we're going to see a little bit of a shift but even as we've seen before we're committing to budgeting for all these positions if we end up with a year like last year where we still have nine pages worth of vacancies i mean we're we're budgeting this money this is our, just our projection but what we actually end up netting could be vastly different so we're not saying we're going to pay this many people and we're going to find them um, it's just really what we end up expending by the end of the year. And enrollment's going to drive that a lot in October. I'm just present on hold. And uh, I think to clarify too, some of what I was suggesting, if asking for your suggestions on uh, what would it look like to set us on a better path going in the years forward. Some of that's for next year and the following year. What are the bigger changes we're going to need to do as a district, um, not just this year? So are there any additional questions? Trustee Ross, I know I told you that was my last question. I am not a liar, but I'm so sorry. I just keep having more questions. Um, professional development, um, I just reflect back to like my own program and how much I love training. I, I love it. But is and is our training evaluated? Like, is it coming back to us that like, yes, this this professional development is totally working, and we're so glad you're putting one hundred and fifty thousand dollars into our professional development. I mean, what's the reassurance that these things are working and that we should continue investing in them? Michelle Garcia here. Um, so. 
there are surveys and there's feedback forms and that type of thing whenever we administer um, any kind of professional development. So from our PD days that are built into the contract that are non-school days, so non-ADA days, but we have all of our staff here um, on paid days to train them, right? So um, from those days to anything that we provide after school uh, and, and, and that type of thing. So you know, when, when you look at the feedback and, and the coaches have presented in the past, they were unable to present this June, but they are going to come back in the fall with some of their data from this, this past year. And uh, when they presented in the past, there was a lot of positive feedback about the coaching program. So if you think about um, and, and professional development, and I say coaching program because it's typically our coaches that present the PD um, or, you know, or if it's a PD day, we may have to secure it. So for textbook adoptions and that type of thing. Um, but if you look at providing professional development to staff um, helps them become more effective and highly qualified. It makes them feel valued and therefore um, we can retain staff that way. Um, it helps us to avoid things like over identification of students with disabilities and it helps us serve our English learners. I can tell you that we have made such gains in providing designated and integrated ELD in this district, but without the training, there's no way. I mean, there's no way to get the information to our educators unless we can provide training for them. And so if you think about all the changes in education, um, I know education moves slow, but sometimes the laws move fast, right? So um, if, if you think about the laws and all of the information that our educators need to have to effectively serve our kids, that's all uh, all that information is given to them through professional development because we can't just put together a list of things and have them read and understand. We have to go through the process of that teaching and learning. So, I mean, you know, if the board decides that that's not something that the board wants to continue with, then then that's the direction we move. But I can tell you just from my own experience here, and this is I'm ending year four, starting year five. When I came to the district, the feedback was from the people that I worked with, especially on the curriculum advisory team was um, we have not had enough professional development. And we we want that. And so um, and I also heard that they want um, more conference style, more choice, teacher choice. So if I'm an educator and a professional, I know what I'm good at and I know what I need to to become better at or, or what I want to learn more about. And so give us a variety of choices and let us select. And so we've we've been doing that. And and hence so we've had great feedback for that. CBO Heather Leslie again, um, and that's the program answer. <laughs> And then the budget answer um, with that, for example, and not saying that we would want to cut it, you know, necessarily at all. Um, however, I think what you're referring to is the professional development allocation that's in uh, the LCAP too, because that that's something that really over the umbrella comes. And it's just, you know, just very key to remember that we have certain metrics that we have to meet in the LCAP. And that if we were like to say, just say, okay, well, like, let's take that down at least half. We would have like let's say you know seventy thousand dollars or even the full hundred and fifty that we would have to still target only within those metrics and only to um the students that it's meant to affect so it still wouldn't hit our bottom line necessarily it still wouldn't be free money that we could use in other places it would be we would still we would just free that up from that one thing and then need to apply it to another specific category because it's 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 under the umbrella of our general fund and unrestricted but it really is restricted to supplemental and concentration um Trustee Ross, I do appreciate, again, I, I love training and I'll take any training you want to give me and I keep requesting it and asking for it. So I know the value of it. I, however, have heard so many mixed feelings about professional development and teachers have to miss days and we have to get substitutes. This is all additional money. Is there any way we could um, look at some kind of survey or something like that for the teachers that would say what training is effective and what training we can let go of? Because I know that sounds can be used for a lot of different stuff in that similar theme. Um, in terms of Superintendent Michelle G. Garcia here. So um, we'll bring you that data in the fall because like I say, we collect that data each year. We have an ongoing survey that we push out at the end of every PD day and, and with every PD that's being offered, the coaches are putting that presentation together. They were originally going to present in June, but we had so many um, 
agenda items that I um, I asked them to push it out. I didn't want to call them back now when they're off. Um, they've been here working anyway, but I didn't want to call them back for an evening in June for a special board meeting. I figured it would be more well received when everybody's fresh and they can come back and present. So it is on their agenda to present. Um, and, and also, I just want to say as well that um, I'm just going to give another um, kudos to the professional development that we um, provide because surrounding districts have asked for our PD catalog. So some might not like some of the things that we do and that's understandable, but, but overall the response has been positive enough, so positive that I, I you know, ending the program, if that's what we must do, then, then we do it. But if we can continue the program and continue um, serving our educators, then that's great. Um, Trustee Brickler. I'm not trying to malign professional development or curriculum adoptions, any of those things, because I think sometimes, you know, we have to make those investments in order to be better um, as a district and, and it's, and it impacts our ability to attract families um, and students into our district, that there's this relationship between um, uh, the quality of the education that we provide and um you know, how many, and enrollment essentially. So I, I don't mean to undermine any of those programs. I think I feel a lot of urgency when I look at this budget that we need to be cutting this year and not waiting until the following year because it it snowballs and that it just is really unacceptable to me to see what a, um, like a thin margin we have remaining in our account if all goes well, if all goes as planned. Um, and in the third year out. I've never seen such low fund balances. So it just, it makes me really uncomfortable. And so I think, I think what president Holt was saying is let's ask staff to propose what that would be. And I'm saying that I, I want to see it happen sooner rather than later. I don't know if there's a way for us to, you know, I guess we could approve the budget um, with the understanding that additional cuts are needed. Right. This is President Holt. I, I think uh, what we're hearing from uh, administration is that they also intend to beat their metrics on this budget um, so that they, you know, we're budgeting that, allocating the funds, but um, not intending to necessarily spend the most on all of those. So I, I, I'm just concerned to be a little bit late in the game to ask them to to give us a new budget, you know, incorporating the changes that we would really like to see or something that would satisfy, I think, what you and I are requesting. That's not what I'm saying. We have to have a budget in place. Mm -hmm. I think that there's a way for us to approve the budget with the understanding that in the next few months we'll receive um, staff district or you know, administrative suggestions as to what else could be cut. Um, CBO Heather Leslie, I, th I think absolutely. And um, as you'll see in the presentation and even some of the narratives and the criteria and standard, it, it refers to that. Um, you know, significant cuts or, you know, evaluations and how to reduce expenditures will be needed for that. So I think, I think that's a, a kind of already woven in, which is good. This is President Holt. Are there any additional questions? This one? All right. Well, thank you. And with that, uh, we've got a little bit left, uh, but I'd like to take a five minute recess. It is uh, let's just round up, actually, and we will resume here at 7.50. Excuse me, 7.55.
Okay. It's 7.55. We are returning from recess. This is President Holt again. Uh, moving to item 10, the consent agenda. And do we have a motion? I will go ahead and make a motion to um, <clears throat> uh, for the uh, consent agenda for approval. Uh, Sarah Brickler, I'll second. Oh, sorry, Jason Wedge. <laughs> and President Holt, uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 And those opposed? None opposed. And the motion passes. Motion carries. Moving to item 11. Uh, approval of resolution 22-23-27 requesting collection of charges on Placer County tax roll. This is interim superintendent Luchi Garcia. Annually, the board must approve a res this resolution requesting taxes on the community facility district levied by the county of Placer. Administration recommends the approval of this resolution. President Holt, are there any any clarifying questions? Yeah. No, seeing none. Uh, is there a motion? Jason Wedge, I will go ahead and make a motion to uh, approve this agenda. I'll second this, that. Uh, uh, resolution twenty two twenty three thirty seven resolution. So, Claire, Vice President Wedges. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. I'm clarifying. Oh, sorry. What's that? Oh no, no. Sorry. Oh, I I thought we had a a motion or um and a second. Yeah, there was. Just, if you could hear I wanted hear to clarify it. the language. Okay. Um, just so, uh, Vice President Wedge, you have moved to approve the resolution, and Trustee Dowd has seconded it. Correct. All right. Correct. That's just yeah, just language there. All right. Okay, I'll do the roll call vote. Great. Um, being that it's a resolution, so um, I'm gonna. Um, start with Trustee Dowd. Aye. Clerk Brickler, aye. Trustee Ross. Aye. President Holt. Aye. And Vice President Wedge. Aye. And seeing unanimous approval, the item uh, or the resolution carries. Moving to item 12, information discussion items, non-classroom based determination of funding. Okay, um, so there was a request to receive information on the funding de determination for Alta Vista Charter, and we did receive back from the state that um, funding, what's the specific language, that we that we would receive funding, 100% funding for the charter and the school program. See, I knew I was going to mess that up, so I'm going to turn that to the It's been a long night. So. So CBO Heather Leslie again. So yes, um, as uh, interim superintendent Lucia Garcia said, um, uh, we finally, as we had applied um, to see about non-classroom based and from what we can tell from the California Department of Education uh, funding determination that came in towards the end of May um, is that they would be eligible for funding uh, for a homeschool program. However, as we have stated, um, the board had already voted to um, uh, to, I don't want to say liquidate, to close the dependent charter school. And um, we kind of knew that this determination was going to come after that decision um, in order to meet the rest of our deadlines. Um, however, we do know that that is um, a determination that they would have had. Uh, Trustee Ross, clarifying question. If someone who voted yes was to redact their vote, um, yes to close and they redact their vote, would that allow for us to re-vote and possibly keep this charter open to non-classroom, non-base classroom? Uh, CBO Heather Leslie, I'm I'm going to have to defer to uh, governance um, research on that. We may have to talk to legal and see how that would look. Um, from a fiscal perspective, um, that kind of changes the budget quite a bit too and how that looks. So if we were to look at a homeschool only component, um, we're not looking at an immediate one. And I don't know if we could put a, just have it open and not do anything with it for a while, but there is going to have to be an investment in um, homeschool charter tracking programs. Um, we would have to look at um, someone to oversee the operations of that. Obviously, um, I don't think the two of us would, I'm gonna be honest, I, I probably wouldn't have that 
um, bandwidth myself. I don't know about interim superintendent Lucia Garcia, so we would need that as well and have to look into getting teacher of record on board. So you're saying it is a possibility? I'm saying that I don't know that's not, but I want the board to be aware that it will be a fiscal investment and there is no guarantee how many students that we would have come over right away. Interim Superintendent Lucci Garcia, um, I, I would have to look into um, whether or not we can do that. So I will look into that if the board um, would like to direct me to do that. I think if there's a possible, Chesty Ross, if there's a possibility of investing in something that is potentially going to make us money, it's worth our investigation. That would make the charter school money. <laughs> it still benefits, right? It still benefits our district to have that money. Uh, this is uh, Jason Wedge. Um, so one of the questions earlier, I understand that it would benefit the charter but a, a percentage would be given back to the district. Do we know what that percentage is? Uh, CBO Heather Leslie again. So it's not a, a flat percentage that like we would just get as a district. Um, what it would do is the higher the expenses out, we would charge indirect charges to that fund. So depending on what the expenses were in order to run that program would be the percentage that we would receive back in indirect costs. So uh, this is President Holt. Um, you know, I, I'm con I don't know if I want to try to rehash what we just went through. Um, I think there was six families that had been interested in the home study program at Alta Vista Community Charter before, um, and that was part of what led to the determination of the board to ultimately close the charter. Um, so, um, you know, if we get a legal clarification, um, great. Um, I think you know that'd be fine. Governance, you know, if we have the legal clarification for if a vote could be redacted, if that would change and we could bring it back, then for clarification purposes, absolutely. Um, but otherwise, uh, at this time, I don't think that's part of tonight's agenda either is to get into whether or not it's a good idea. Uh, Trustee Ross, I do just want to mention that Blue Door had proposed the possibility of 80 to 120 students coming back. So it, again, it, I think it is worth our time to get that research and just see if it's a possibility. So I think uh, this President Holt, I think interim superintendents looking for uh, our approval. Uh, do we want her to do, do we want administration to do that research? It would be helpful to understand um, there's a there's a whole notification process when you close a school. Um, is it possible? Can, can that now that we understand that the funding is available for a non classroom based? I, I would like to know the answer whether or not the school could be operated as homeschool. I think there's two big questions is can that be kind of retracted that decision to close the charter? And um, Sorry. So, can 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 that be undone? That deci decision for the pr um, purpose of pursuing a homeschool program, and can you have like a one year gap essentially? So we're not prepared for to operate a homeschool program in twenty three twenty four. So, is there a way to kind of delay implementation? Uh, this is President Holt. Uh, super, interim superintendent, how many hours do you think the request would take uh, as it's currently phrased? The request I have written down is, can we redact a vote? So that's going to be me reaching out to legal. So it'll be, you know, whatever costs we incur with legal and then um, basically my email. And then if there's any clarification, I can I can do that um, probably through email or a quick phone call. I don't think that will take more than 30 minutes, unless there's some caveat that I, I can't think of. Um, as far as the other question, I um, I would need more clarification on that. And then I would have to, that probably would take a little bit longer because if the, if the question is, what, would it be legal or CDE? Because if it's, because we've already notified, we, we've already done the notification through CDE and all that. So I think it's gonna be more than just legal. I think it's gonna be both reaching out to CDE and, um, but again, that would start with an email. So that would be, 
not as much time, but I wouldn't even know exactly what it is that I'm seeking information on. So I can get that right when I email them. Um, and then from there, I'd have to meet with legal. So that might be a little bit more than, you know, 30 minutes, but um, it could be a, a cut and dry answer as well, that this isn't something that we can do, or, you know, this isn't here, are the steps, look at the CD page. So I'm not sure if that helped. I, I'm going through all my mind, like what would I, you know, I'm trying to be as transparent with what I, what I think the process is. If I get CDE involved, it's going to take a little bit longer. I'm just going to be honest. But thank you. And and it and it could be that if I ask legal about about redacting a vote. Um, depending on the answer, that could end the whole conversation there, right? So if it's not possible, then that conversation's done. So I just want to put that out there as it, well. Is it, Sarah Brickler, is it really redacting a vote? Or I think that there is some language that I was looking for it in my Rosenberg's rules. Um, we might be able to resolve it by looking at a document about, um, you know, the parliamentary procedure we follow, that if you were... Um, if you voted yes on something that you could, it's basically like the request to reconsider that you could bring it back. That, that That's always an, an option. I think we know that part, actually. I, I think it's different language than, um, it's not necessarily redacting. It's, there are I, other I, options I, I to re- it's rescinding. <laughs> to rescind a vote? Yeah. Yeah. So, so I just, you know, just want to, you know, chime in on this conversation. And, uh, you know, I've, I've, I've made this comment in the past is that, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're dealing with a lot of, you know, ifs and what's and everything. Um, I mean, I, I know it was mentioned that Blue Door says there's 120 students, but I don't think that conversation has been, you know, offered to anybody else. I mean, if when if that was the case when we were talking about this, why wasn't Blue Door here representing saying, hey, you know what, we have 120 students, you know, for for the homeschool. So, uh, this President Holt, I think we're getting too far away from what we need to be discussing tonight and what's on the agenda and getting more back into rehashing the altruistic question. Uh, so right now, uh, the question is, uh, do we want the administration to look into what legal requirement would there be uh, to uh, make it possible for Altavista Community Charter School uh, to operate as a home study program? Um, and I think for information purposes, um, that I, I see no reason to not get that uh, for information purposes. So, um, But otherwise, I don't think we need to pursue any more of the uh, Alta Vista Blue Door um, conversation this evening. Okay. All right. So uh, with that, uh, it is 8.08 and this meeting is adjourned. Thank you.